Good evening, everybody. It's uh, July 29th, Frontier School Committee meeting. Um, it's 5.03. Uh, first thing on the agenda, we're going to approve the minutes from July 16th first. Move to accept, Mr. Chairman. Thank Second. you, Bill. Second. Thank you, Phil. Do a roll call. Judy. Yep. Phil. Yes. Yep. Damien. Yes. Keith. Yes. Bill. Yep. Mary. Yes. Olivia. Yes. And Missy. Yes. Uh, Lynn hasn't come on yet, right? Okay. Um, anybody new that just came on, if you guys, um, other than school committee members and um, administrators, if you can mute and non-pitchers on your on the computer, please. Um, we're gonna we're gonna have public comment after we do the review and discussion for the draft return to school. So last night was a little different. If you guys were on for the union, they did the public comment first. We're going to do public comment after we review and discuss it. School committee members will go first with this discussion, and then the public could come on, and um, you could type in uh, in the chat area, and Scott Dredge uh, will do one at a time, and um, and we'll go from there. Does anybody have any questions ahead of time? Okay. So, Darius, you want to take over? Sure. Welcome, everyone. Um, <clears throat> I'm going to do kind of what I did last night, but I also have um, with Sarah Mitchell is with me tonight um, to help me go through this. So I'm going to do a um, I'm going to share my screen and go through just to give an overview of what we're talking about of the, the different plans um, and to kind of begin our conversation. So. Everybody see that all right? So, you know, basically, you know, again, um, we have two plans. Well, there's three plans that we're submitting to the state at the end of this week. You know, there's all back, the hybrid, and then the remote plan. And so really the all back coming back, I, you know, while I take some liberty to think not spend a lot of time on that, other than the fact that we really can't pull it off um, without incurring large expenses and whatnot. So we're really just talking about the hybrid plan and the remote plan. Mm -hmm. And so you know, if people want to talk about all back plan, we certainly can do that, but I don't have a lot of... Um, <clears throat> a lot of working on that because you know we're as everybody knows this is kind of where the two focus plans we're looking at. So um, looking at the hybrid plan first, um, the hybrid plan we're looking at several several phases, and you know starting at first with phase zero is the teacher training, and you know right now it's just days to be determined. Um, we did get information from the state that there's going to be ten days of teacher training prior to the beginning of the school year, so that means the overall school year has been reduced by the state from 180 to 170. Um, this will um, allow us to have more professional development days um, for the teachers before the school year begins. And so, you know, something that we, you know, I talked about, I think I was talking about five before where the commission was trying to get in this negotiation with the MTA, it ended up being 10. Um, so we're going to have these 10 days prior. So right now we're looking at, I got to come up with a calendar and I promise to have that for you for the next time, but I have to discuss with the union if we're going to start before the 26th or not. But if we start on the 26th, the first day of school, um, of whatever we choose, uh, whatever plans choose would be the 11th of September, um, if I count correctly my 10 days there. So um, so that's the first part. And then once we start school, we're looking at doing some orientation days. Um, and then before going into phase one, two, and three. And so I'm gonna kind of hand it over to Sarah, you there? I am, yep. And so I'm gonna, I'm, gonna I'm gonna scroll down to our, um, to where it talks about this plan. Oh, I'm gonna share this plan with everybody. Yeah. Give me one second. I'm just gonna put this in the in the chat box so people can follow along at their own. School committee got this a few days ago, but this will allow if you're if you're watching, you can click on that and you can go your own speed through this plan and not rely on me to uh, to do that. that Makes sense. All right. There, where do you want me to go here? Right there is a good start. 
Um, so what we started to do was to um, give you some sample schedules because I think, um, as you know, at the middle and high school level, we're really driven by our schedule. Um, and so in the beginning, if we go down to phase two, phase one is really about getting students in the building, getting some type of orientation um, for them. Um, this is looking at both, this is looking particularly at the middle school. These students are new to our building. There's going to be a lot of new routines anyway. Um, and it's really about teaching students where to go, how to stay socially distanced as they're going there, where are they going to actually go into the building as they're coming into the building. And there'll be a lot of handholding in these initial stages. And the beginning part is really about getting to know each other, getting to know these new routines, and um, figuring out how we're going to navigate um, schooling in a very, very different context. Um, so if you go down, uh, phase two will bring students into the building by teams. And um, this was an idea that one of our middle school teachers had, which I thought was a very good idea, which is looking at bringing in each team um, in its entirety, as opposed to splitting the teams in half. Um, this would allow the team to concentrate on the students that are there in person. And then the three days that they're remote, they're working with the same group of students and it allows the um, teachers to really focus all their energy on the students that they're working with directly um, rather than having to juggle, which we're gonna see um, a little bit later on in the high school. So we can flip down to the first. Sir, can, you, uh, can, sorry. Sir, can you explain that you have a seven team and eight team and a seven, eight team just for clarification? Yeah, very, people? very good point. So our numbers break out so that we have, we'll have a group of teachers um, and we're really revisiting back uh, for any of you that were on school committee 10 years ago, which some of you were, um, it breaks it down to the old three team model. So we would have one team that would be uh, four sections of all grade seven students. We would have one team that would be four sections of all grade eight students. And then we would have one section or one team that would be two seventh grade sections and two eighth grade sections. It doesn't mean that students are taking classes together in that seven, eight team. They're still getting their seventh grade classes and their eighth grade classes in those uh, grade levels. And they're not mixing uh, for those core content areas, but it's just a way of dividing up our students. And the teachers in that team um, are well-versed in teaching both the seventh grade curriculum and the eighth grade curriculum. So they can very easily go back and forth between the two curriculums for those grade levels. We can sc scroll on down and we'll go to the first sample schedule. Uh, phase three just adds a day of instruction. Um, so we've laid it out, um, giving students a little bit more time in the day to break in between. Um, the idea is that if you've only got one or two teams in the building at a time, there'll be lots of opportunities for students to get outside take their mass breaks outside, although in inclement weather, we'll have to figure out a way to get students socially distanced and give them their mass breaks indoors. Um, but the day just unfolds with a, just a few more breaks in it. We learned a lot this summer um, doing our kind of trial summer program. We only had 12 students. Um, we talked every day about what were some of the challenges. And one of the clear challenges is gonna be the time that it takes to move students in and out of the building for those mass breaks. Um, and so it's going to be a little bit of a work in progress those first few weeks as we figure out, is that block really enough time to move students out for a mass break and to move them back into the building? So that's why this is a sample schedule because we're going to have to live it a little bit and we're gonna to have to play with it in order to be able to um, figure out exactly what's gonna work for our student groups. So if we keep on going down. So now we're at the high school hybrid schedule and the schedule looks a little bit different. And that is because we don't have clean cutoffs by grade level. You know, in an ideal world, in a pandemic world, ideally we would have grade nine students taking all grade nine classes, grade 10 students taking all grade 10 classes. But as you all know, it just doesn't break down that way. Uh, we really work hard to provide our students with as much opportunity as possible. And that means a lot of mixed classes. And so the way that we broke it down at the high school level was we broke it down in cohorts. We are looking at last name of alphabet as the way to divide those groups. And we're still going through the class lists um, to figure out exactly where that split would come. And we may take some groups and put them all together. So for example, if we have a specialized program, we may have them all be 
part of cohort A because that's what's going to work best for that specialized classroom. Um, so students would attend two days a week, similar to the middle school in this phase two. And then Wednesday, we're looking at a half day of remote learning for teachers, so they would get their classes started. But we've also added in a component where teachers would actually be connecting with their students on a one-to-one. -one. And again, we're still working out some of those details about how that would happen and which students would be connecting with. But the idea is to build those relationships solidly early on um, in the high school schedule. So high school teachers, and again, still many, many details and many conversations to be had with high school teachers about how this is gonna work best for them. Um, but they would have that split that I talked about avoiding in the middle school where they would be teaching students in front of them, but they would also have a half a class that would be working remotely from home. Go ahead and scroll on down. Um, so we've also provided um, some more details on remote learning. We learned a lot from our remote learning experiences. And one of the things that we really learned was that students need a predictable schedule. So we looked at locking in the schedule. We would have synchronized learning opportunities. So students would be logging on to the computer. Attendance would be taken. And this is for middle and high school. You can just keep scrolling down, Darius, to the remote sorry. section. Oh, sorry. Bear, just one second. I have, to let people, I have to let people in. OK. <laughs> you, you, you do that, and I'll just chat okay. on. And I'll go right back. Um, sorry, I can go right back. When I hear the little thing there, I got to let people in. Go ahead. <clears throat> Okay, so if you keep scrolling down to the uh, remote section, you can see that the schedule is very, very similar um, to the in-person session because we want to keep that predictability for students so they know where they're supposed to be. This is not to say that students would be online during their entire remote learning session. We don't want that to happen either, but the idea is that teachers are checking in with students. They might be working with a small group of students while they're sending off another group to work on something that's a paper pencil activity. Um, we do understand that this could add up to a lot of screen time if we're not careful in the way we design this. We've also put into this plan a couple of, um, particularly for middle school, a remote only schedule. It would look very, very similar to the, the hybrid schedule as far as the remote section, um, but we are concentrating and focusing some energy on those students that are choosing the remote only plan. We wanna make sure that those students are getting a high quality educational experience, we're looking at having dedicated faculty for that at the middle school level. And then at the high school level, we're looking at a lot of different options, including um, frontier faculty-led classes, VHS classes. We're looking at a product called Edgenuity to provide us with some more content for students so that we can really design a schedule and a program that will work for students that are choosing that remote only if we are in the hybrid model. So I see Darius says, totally left our screen now. I was worried about my internet connection. Um, so do does anyone have questions about some of those schedules and plans? Oh, he's back. Uh, yeah, I got a question. Um, I know uh, you talked about in the high school uh, trying to uh, put the cohorts or the teams by alphabetical order. Um, you didn't mention how you would do that with the middle school and to, f and to keep the question going. Um, I was on one of the town hall meetings with um, Tina last week uh, talking about the um, elementary school and how they're going to uh, do their schedules. Is there any discussion or talk? And I know it's probably so complicated, you're not going to capture every family. Um, but if you alpha, if you did alphabetical order for the entire district, would it capture at least the majority of students? I know for, for one, my family, both me and my wife work and we're going to be relying on our eighth grader to watch our elementary school child and if they could pair up on the same days uh, it would be very very helpful yeah so you bring up some good points so as far as let me just answer your first question first which is about the the teaming and how the grades are how the teams are broken up for the middle school level um, so we asked the um, elementary school teachers, because we didn't have the, we usually have a lot of meetings in the spring between um, the elementary school and Frontier in-person meetings, and we go through each student. We did fortunately have an opportunity to do those meetings early on in January, but we asked them for some additional information this year, because we really would like to create um, 
groups that are as mixed as possible as far as need and ability level. Uh, we don't want to have a, a group that is tracking through at the high level or a group that's tracking through uh, because they need additional services. So that's how those groups were created. They did keep an alphabetical theme in the middle school, but it's not as tight as the high school schedule will be. Um, we ha did have a long conversation. Um, we've been working on the schedule. Yesterday, we spent about three hours kind of teasing out some more details um, along with the schedule and how exploratories will work and some of those components. And we did talk about the need for families to have students together sometimes. Um, and we admitted in the group that if we could do it for some family, families, we would do our best to accommodate because we do understand that uh, middle and high school students are really important when you're talking about caring for younger elementary school students. But we also admitted that we weren't going to be able to do it um, for everyone and we probably weren't going to be able to do it for the masses, at least ahead of time. Um, so if we can get the information out early, we might be able to do some direct swaps because in theory, a lot of the high school classes would be meeting. But at the same time, as I was dividing the alphabet, uh, for example, at J, um, I came to a couple of classes where there were only three students left in that class for the other group. And it was a small class. And it seemed like, oh, you know what? We probably should put those three students into the, the other cohort just to keep the whole class together. So if we run into those situations and that cohort is not meeting at the same time as elementary, uh, we're going to be in trouble. Uh, we, there might be some flexibility with some elementary schools to also do some switching to try to accommodate the high school schedule. But again, if they're doing a whole grade level and a third grader happens to be on the opposite dates, um, we're going to have a hard time coordinating. So I guess my answer is we understand and we hope to be able to accommodate as many families as we can, um, but there's no guarantee that we're going to get to 100 percent. Okay, thanks, sir. Does any other committee uh, members have questions? Just raise your hand and. Olivia? Control D? I can work this. Um, so I just had a question which we. Uh, about the locker rooms, um, since you know phys ed is going to be happening, um, one of my and I one of my kids was asking about that, and I said, "Well, you're still going to have phys ed; it doesn't just go away." <laughs> um, and she said, "Well, what if it's hot outside and we're playing a game and we get sweaty? Do we then have to sit in those clothes all day?" And I said, "I really don't know about the locker room because there's no way to police that, so I don't know if there's been any talk about that, um, or." since they can't go to lockers anyway, like can they not go to the locker room and will they, I don't know, have to do quiet games? I don't know. Well, the good news is, and I'm gonna turn it over to Scott Dredge for some, some particulars on this, uh, but the good news is PE will be at the end of the day for middle schoolers every day. So at least if we uh, shut down the locker rooms, which I imagine, I'll turn it to Scott, I mean, it, that, it looks like that's the direction we're going in as far as not right. letting them use the locker rooms because it's just such a confined space. Right. Um, at, least, at least they won't be sweaty for very long. Um, <laughs> and we're also trying to minimize, we're, we're changing up the exploratories um, so that they would have one exploratory each day that they're in physically in school and PE would be one of them one day and then there would be another exploratory on the other day. So it would kind of go back to that middle school model of having PE once a week. Um, but I hear her concerns because I- Well, and she's in high school. <laughs> oh, high school. Oh, high school. Yes. Yeah. So yeah. So I'll turn it over to Scott to, on his okay. thoughts on- Yeah, no, I, I hear you. <laughs> Excellent question, Olivia. Um, from an operation standpoint, um, locker rooms are not uh, a, a really viable option at this point. Right. Um, for all of those reasons that that we're, we know and are aware of. Um, I do know that in, in terms of uh, PE and when there's going to be PE, there's going to be options um, such as walking groups and things like that. For folks who don't particularly want to uh, get involved in any um, games and the games and, and, and things that are going to be offered. Um, I'm pretty, I'm pretty confident in, in Carl and Missy's ability to design socially distant uh, opportunities yeah. for exercise. So, um, it, it, embedded in and everything we've always done is is variety and option. And I know that one of those will be a, a walking group, um, which would probably alleviate your daughter's fears. 
<laughs> well, you know, you don't want, yeah. <laughs> teenage girls don't want to smell yucky in school. I hear you. <laughs> <laughs> I know that seems kind of um, silly. Um, then I just, I noticed that there was a difference between um, this schedule that is in this new and the older schedule in which they were going Monday and Tuesday, the same group was going Monday and Tuesday, and then the next group was going Thursday and Friday. And I'm just, um, I didn't know what the thoughts were around that. Um, just from a mom standpoint of how long it takes me to clean my house, I can't imagine a time to like clean everything for the next cohort in the evening, you know, for the next day. Yeah, so I'll speak to the education piece and then I'll turn it to my colleagues for the um, for the cleaning piece because they're they've got a pretty good handle on that. So from the education piece, um, five days seem like an awfully long time to go without a class. Um, yeah. And so we ended up um, switching it to that Monday, Thursday and um, mixing up the schedule so that we would get students a little bit more spread out. So there would be more frequent check ins. Um, we just had a hard time seeing that kids were really going to maintain that momentum for five days without seeing their teacher. So that's the education piece. I agree. And, uh, Scott, I, I don't know whether you want to speak to the, or George, to the cleaning piece. I think with the, with, with the cleaning piece, one of the things that's going to have to happen, at least in, in, uh, for our building, um, is we need to restructure our uh, custodial schedules. Right now we have two on during the day and four on at night by balancing out the day and night schedule, we'll beef up our ability to uh, regularly clean things during the school day and then continue that uh, at night. And and there are gonna be things that like we've typically done and in, in, in responsibilities we've had them do at night, which we're going to um, not focus on, which weren't so much of a, like a, a cleaning thing, but more maintenance type stuff. Cleaning is gonna take the priority um, so manipulating their schedules and making sure it's balanced for day and night is going to help. And then, uh, that Wednesday is going to be a real deep clean opportunity as well. Does anybody else have a question from the committee so far? What Sarah was talking about? Sarah, you want to continue? Is there more to continue? Uh, uh, well, that kind of sums up the schedule. I mean, we are working also the second piece of all of this and um, is the professional development. Um, those 10 days um, are really going to help us to get up to speed on remote learning in particular, because even if we're talking about a hybrid model, there's a substantial amount of remote learning that's happening in that model. Um, Kim McCarthy and myself just put in a, a large book order for the distance learning playbook for all of our faculty. Um, and that's a book that takes teachers through all the different um, scenarios and provides some really sound research-based instructional strategies. Some of them are strategies that you would use in every classroom, um, whether you're remote or not remote, um, but it particularly focuses on the remote learning aspect of education that we're all facing. Um, so we're really going to be looking a lot at that. Obviously, we're going to be uh, focusing a lot on our social justice piece. Um, I just had a very brief conversation via email with the grade eight team. They're planning on um, studying the book uh, Stamped, um, and it's called Stamped from the Beginning, and really focusing on um, anti-racism and social justice in that grade eight read, um, which will be great. Um, and then in addition, we have, um, we didn't know the pandemic was coming. So last year we thought our only initiative was going to be um, our new special ed model in the high school. And so we did do some work on that last spring and we'll have some professional development around that also as we start the school year. The idea with the new model is that special educators will be doing more uh, co-teaching with teachers and collaborative teaching um, in the core content areas. Um, and that will help to support students both in the classroom and during their uh, skills lab. So special educators won't be doing block after block of skills support. They'll be doing one block of skills support and then they'll be um, integrated into the curriculum and classroom. Um, I, I got a question. Um, how about special, special education? Um, there's been a lot of talk about it, uh, concerned parents. I'm getting emails. I'm just, I, you know, can you? Yeah. So that's me? yeah. So let me let me deal with the schedule piece, and then I'll turn it over to Karen for um, some of the details. Uh, so okay. as far as scheduling, what we've talked about is uh, students that are on general IEPs. Um, 
So they're fully mainstreamed and they just might have some extra skills lab or an extra support. Uh, we're looking at increasing their attendance at school by one day from whatever the general population is. So initially in phase two, we have two days for the general education students and we would add one additional day for students on IEPs. For our sub-separate populations, uh, we would be looking at adding two days of instruction in addition to what the general education is getting. And I'll turn it over to Karen for some more details on what we're doing there. Mm -hmm. um, hi, everybody. Karen Ferrandino. I'm the Director of Special Education for Frontier uh, and Union 38 School Districts. Uh, Bob, to answer your question, I'm not sure exactly what questions you have, but I think some of the most important information I've shared before is just to kind of to know that on July 9th, the Department of Elementary and Secondary Education sent out their supplemental guidance on opening schools. Um, so when we're looking at um, our general reopening plan, we're also looking at that supplemental guidance for special education. And it highlighted two things really um, that pop out in my mind is one, um, when we were in remote learning, it, it kept changing our guidance as we were going through those phases of remote learning last year. Uh, but where we are opening, the guidance is really IEPs will be implemented. And that is some of the concerns that parents have had in the past as it looked different. We had remote learning plans and it kept changing kind of, this is gonna be very different because we are going to be looking at those IEPs and in our model ensure that we have um, the supports and services to be able to implement the IEPs. The second uh, priority that comes out of there um, is important no matter what model you choose because the second point was high priority students um, and we're looking at that really right now as our students that were in substantially separate programming, students who are unable to access remote learning, it is not possible for them to do that. Um, would be high priority students and the Department of Elementary and Secondary Education said all districts have a responsibility to uh, to develop in-person instruction for those students to de define who they are and to supply them with as much in-person instruction as feasible. And that's why uh, Sarah is sharing today that at Frontier, uh, in order to meet that obligation, really kind of looking at, hey, why don't we look at all our I students on IEPs and offer that third additional day when we're opening to ensure that they get those additional supports and services in person. And then we're really going in and going to pull out our, our really high priority students, those that are in substantially separate program and more complex disabilities and offer a fourth day. We are expanding our continuum is, is what I, I think we, to share with everybody is um, we're really looking at some of our more complex kids individually, and what do we need to do to make sure that they have the most in purpose and instruction as possible. So I'm not sure what other questions you get. You can always send people, everybody's willing to, I am a, totally accessible. You can contact me uh, by email, uh, Karen Ferrandino. Uh, we also, um, the last thing I should share with you is we pulled together a special education strategic planning committee. It uh, involves administrators, faculty, parents from our special education planning, our special education parental advisory council has reached out and found a representative from each of the schools. And we're meeting this Friday is our first meeting and we're looking at all of this. We're looking at it to the moment we open our doors, we'll have three or four meetings uh, with the strategic planning committee. And we're gonna be meeting all next year because it's going to be fluid. Uh, we're gonna be looking at students needs have changed since we've seen them last. Um, some once before we might say this is a priority now that we haven't seen them in so long some of their goals may have changed the priorities of the supplemental services we offer uh, may be different so it will involve a lot of communication um, and ongoing communication I hope that answers your question to share with parents as they reach out to you uh, yep. but I'm happy to talk to anyone that reaches out to school committee or anyone can contact me thanks Karen <laughs> thank you Sarah, do you want to continue on with the schedule or are we all? Yeah, it looks like you might have a couple more questions. Amy, you want to go first, Damien? I know you were, when I was asking a question, do you have a question, Damien? Yeah, it's just, I, I think it's really been answered before. I know, I know these models, they can float between one model to the next. You know, I think we're all leaning towards the hybrid model. You know, I, I, we'll talk about it more tonight and maybe vote on it, I, I, I think. I'm not sure about that. Um, I, probably in reality, it, you know, if we start out 
you know, re, you know, hybrid, it's probably eventually going to go remote with the way things are looking in the country. But for some pie in the sky dream, if if things go the other way, if there's a vaccine, you know, which is probably really unlikely, but if it did, can we jump in and go full on right back to norm, not norm, not, not normal, like the way it was, there's probably all, there's going to be restrictions, but um, normal in the sense, like, would we just kind of evolve into this kind of hybrid model, but, but five days a week, or would it really go back to kind of like, uh, um, can, can we, can we flip a switch to back to normal? I don't know. I, I mean, I know it's pie in the sky and it's not going to happen, but I, you know, <laughs> I thought I'd just ask. We can, we, we can all dream. We can all dream. Um, yeah, I think the, um, if you look at the phase two and the phase three, phase three brings in three quarters of the students, um, on three days a week. So it ups it to three. You could very easily up it to four and you can get back to five pretty easily. So if we had a magic cure and um, they gave us the go ahead to go back to full in-person instruction, we can do that. We can also phase out to remote because the hybrid, hybrid is one of those in-between plans. We've got remote already built into it. And so then we could phase in more remote days as needed. Um, you know, or all remote days, because we probably are not going to go a lot lower than um, than two days a week. But Thanks. Missy, you have a question, Missy? Sorry. Uh, yeah, I have I actually have two questions. One, which is probably pretty straightforward, and the other one that might make you crumble a little bit. But um, the first one is, are there... Uh, plans to have cl any classes meet outdoors? Yeah, actually, um, I love the outdoors myself personally. So we've been talking about this for, for months and months. Um, so we have um, located, there's actually a tent right now. Uh, if Darius turns his camera, you can almost see it outside of his office, not quite. Uh, so we have one temp tent on the school grounds right now, and we have plans to order many more. We're waiting to pull the trigger on making that order because we want to make sure that we really are going to be back in some kind of capacity in person. Not that we wouldn't love to have the 11 or 12 tents, tents that we're planning on getting um, for future use, but we do want to make sure that we're able to use them right away. Um, Scott Dredge and I walked around the grounds um, last week just kind of identifying where we could put the tents uh, without killing too much of the athletic fields um, because it, it would be nice to have 10 city all over the baseball field, but I don't think the baseball team would appreciate that when they came back to their field in, in the spring. The, the other question is whether or not there's been any consideration of an adjustment in the school time. Uh, I have talked with a lot of parents who have had kids who have had really wonky schedules since uh, we've been on quarantine here and have kids that are sleeping in much uh, much later than normal. And given that um, the extracurricular activities are not going to influence things as much in the evening, I wonder whether or not that's been part of a discussion. Um, it has. It definitely has been brought up. Um, it gets complicated because we have uh, teacher schedules also to consider. And if they have children in other systems and have childcare, so it got complicated really quickly. Uh, we were able to adjust it when we went to the remote learning last year. Um, and again, we may bump it all an hour if the teachers had that ability to do that. Um, but we thought keeping them on a regular schedule um, was going to be best for everyone, just so that everyone had that predictability built in. But yes, we definitely did talk about it, but I'm not sure it's going to go too much further than conversations. Thought I'd ask. Thanks, Missy. Any other members want to say something? Can I just ask Sarah a question? I'm loving this. I don't have to talk as much tonight. This is great. Um, maybe some other people are enjoying that too. Um, Sarah, could you talk a little bit? I think you know we heard a lot about um, the remote learning, and you know there was challenges this spring. Uh, I think all the K, all the way to the seniors. Um, you know, the state has put out new guidance and such. Do you want to just talk a little bit? I know you've been we've been doing so much work on their hybrid. We haven't put a lot of um, emphasis in sharing and what the 
remote changes to the remote planning are and what the expectations are going to be. And they are quite, they are quite different than what was this spring. So do you want to talk a little bit about that? Sure. So, um, so as you know, in the spring, um, we eased into remote learning, eased in in a weekend, I should say. Um, but initially, the state put out guidance, and they were really um, softballing it. Uh, they wanted, they emphasized no grades. They said you've got to be flexible on attendance, um, and they were really focusing on accommodating students. Um, it's a very, very different look to the plan for those of you who have read it. Um, it's all about attendance. It's all about accountability. It's all about scheduling. Um, and I, so I think the state learned a lot too. We learned that if you didn't grade things, students maybe weren't as interested in participating in, in that particular course. Um, and so we, and looking at the hybrid model and the remote model, we are work, going to work to beef up the remote model. And that's why I put in that schedule in there. So you can kind of take a look and see that um, it really, in the remote learning for if we get to it at this fall and if we do the hybrid, there will be a remote component. Uh, there's really gonna be an expectation that students are in school for that full day. Um, we also wanna be careful that we're not um, putting too large a burden on families to, they need to get their child to the machine in the morning um, get them out of bed. And then at the secondary level, and it's a little bit different when you're dealing with a kindergartner, so I can't speak to elementary, but at the secondary level, uh, the expectation is that our teachers will be able to um, shepherd, guide them through their day and their work assignments. So it will be like a regular class that they're participating in. And again, um, not all online, you know, students need to go offline and they need to oh, work um, that's not in person. I mean, not. Um, dealing with the computer, but there would be an expectation that they would be in class during those times. I actually to jump in on that to kind of follow up on that. Will there be in the spring when there was remote learning, uh, at least in the middle school, I don't know if the, what the high school went to, uh, that we went to, you know, CR for credit. Um, is that going to stay the same or is it, are we now getting grades? And even if we went from hybrid to full remote, are, you know, kids going to be logging in with the, you know, taking attendance and then getting actual grades for the courses and participation that they do? Yeah, it'll be, we'll be back to grades. Um, because I, I think in fairness in the spring, um, credit, no credit did make the most sense. Um, it was new to everyone. Uh, we were fumbling our way through and the idea that you were going to penalize a student for not understanding how to access or not having access. Um, you know, Karen spoke to the special ed population. We now have a plan. If students are falling behind and they're not able to um, keep up with their remote work, uh, we are planning on having a space in the building where students could actually participate in remote learning while in the building. So we could keep those cohorts separate, but we could provide additional support if needed. Um, so we have a lot larger understanding of what students need in order to be successful in this model. And it's not that we're going to, you know, hit the ground and have every problem solved with remote learning. It's still going to be a learning experience for us all. However, we have a few more things that we, we know about students and the way that they learn remotely. Keith, you had a question. You wanna, sorry, Damien. Keith, you have a question? Yeah, well, just a, I was just gonna a comment. Uh, the first question is, if the committee decides to go the hybrid model, what would happen to teachers who feel students will have the option to opt out to go virtual, but what would happen to teachers who have health concerns and who feel that they can't come back in the building? So basically, the, the that part is, uh, you know, uh, more of a it's difficult because we don't know what our, our percentages will be. Um, and so, you know, ideally what would happen is we would use teachers that, you know, have, um, cannot come back, um, and use them in the remote model to teach the students who are doing the re all remote um, option. So remember, in, in all this, the state has told us that, and I think I said that at the beginning of this meeting, I know I said at the beginning of the last one, but the state has, option, has the option that families that don't want to, if we choose a remote model, um, families can also, I mean, choose the, the hybrid model. The families could choose an all remote model. And so we'll have those teachers um, teaching that remote model or providing support to other 
um, you know, the, the remote students who may be in, a part of the, uh, the hybrid. So it, the problem we will have where there's kind of a crapshoot here is that number. If that number gets too large, we will have a staffing issue. Um, and how are we going to deal with that staffing issue is, you know, in the back of my mind, it's kind of, it's hard to, it's hard to get a full um, idea from teachers without having a full plan. As you know, there's a lot of, you know, a lot of, there's a lot of uncertainty among teachers. I um, mean, we heard that quite a bit of that last night was localized and I've heard it, you know, just being in the community, obviously. Um, we're also seeing a statewide and national push from their politics are also involved as well um, as to whether teachers should return to work. Is it really safe? Risk, you know those kind of things. Um, that's part of the that's part of the discussion here tonight. So you you know and Keith obviously I know you know that. Um, so but that is our plan is to try to use those teachers. If we reach a point where we have too many, then it, and we're going to have to make employment decisions. Meaning like you know which ones qualify for under you know under you know protections from the federal laws. There's a lot of different options there. Um, which ones are, are more are aren't protected on the laws, but would like to see a change and then um, try to see if we can provide accommodations. What it means the accommodations we can change that will help them. And then it's going to come to the point where we're going to have to decide what, what are we going to do with those employees? So I'm being trying to be as transparent as possible in this, not, you know, say we have it all figured out. I'm just telling you exactly how we are at this point. Right. Uh, and I appreciate that because I do think that there's, there probably are a, a large number of teachers who do want to return. I, I, it would be interesting to see what the numbers are. Um, but at the same time, we have to take care of teachers who feel that their health would be um, in jeopardy. We go all virtual, that's taking care of that subset, but people who want to return aren't served. But if we go with hybrid, we still have to be able to serve people whose health is a concern. So that's, that's and I appreciate that we will try to take care of those teachers. Uh, and then just a comment would be, if we do go the hybrid, I would love to see if we can tweak the time. 7.30, 7.45 is really early. And if we can maybe give kids a little bit more time to sleep, that would be great. I know it's difficult, but that would be just my one comment. Thanks, Keith. Any other members before we ask the public for any comments? Phil? Yeah, um, so I would just like to uh, follow up on just the, 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 the one little thing about the tents and you said 10 to 12 for Frontier, I suppose. And I, I imagine that there's some for each elementary school as well. And, um, and, and I guess, so, so have we identified funding sources for those, not to be crass and bring up Lucare, um, but, um, uh, you know, and, and also just in general, you know, the, yesterday's meeting had um, members of the public that were not parents, not whatever. And, and they, the, I know the one that contacted me today was just um, in all of all the work that's being done, but just wants to know how they can help and how the, her network of friends can help. And, um, you know, do we still need picnic tables, things like that? Is it, what can we ask the general public of, of whom there are many, many supporters and people that just want to help? And if we can um, outsource, to the extent that we can outsource our needs to the general public, I believe they can be met. So... Phil, you always have the best floral arrangements that I can in your in your picture. I just gotta give you credit there. Um, give credit where credits do you do. Um, uh, yeah, you know the we said I you know I gave my in my uh, my town hall um, thing that we will be sending once we know what direction we're going. You know we'll be putting an ask out to the community. Um, I will say if you are a tent person or know someone who has large tents. Call me or Sarah directly or Scott or George directly. We want to get in touch with that because there is a demand. All the private schools, all the local colleges, they're all going after the tents. The tent vendors are buying more tents so they can rent them out. Um, we discussed how many we should buy versus how many we can rent. Um, and then the finances on that. Um, Shelly, are you able to unmute? I know Shelly's on via phone, so she may have a little bit more technical here. Is that you, Shelly? I'm here. Yeah. I'm here. Do you, want, Can you hear me? Want to give a quick financial overview of what you did last night? Sure, not a problem. Um, so I'm currently still assessing closing out FY20. However, I do feel good about the position that we landed in at the end of the year, being that we were very conservative in our spending towards the end of the year when the crisis started. Um, so I think our revolving funds will be in good shape. And so far, we are looking at for Frontier, about $180,000 in grants that we've received between the municipal funding, 
and the two DESE grants that are coming through. So we're working with um, Sarah closely to put that together and make sure that curriculum needs are met as well as um, purchasing supplies and materials for the school. So, you know, there's still a lot of unknowns, but I do feel like we're in a decent position right now. And once we have our plan um, approved and voted on, we'll be able to move forward with some of our purchasing. But we're trying to be very conservative in what we're ordering to make sure that we're not overbuying or buying things that we don't absolutely need. Um, and I, I think that we're in okay shape at this time. And so I think Phil, exactly that that 180 number we could we could we could get a you know ten thousand dollars worth of tents you know from that 180 number because it is number it is money we do have to spend there are limits uh, deadlines on spending that money we have to spend it by December um, I know she combined those grants together but the largest grant um, we do have to spend by December so and it's got to be you know related to this stuff so I believe. The second part there, it has to be really adjusted. Yeah, that, everything for that last grant, that's the largest grant, does have to be spent by December, and it has to be unbudgeted expenses related to COVID-19. So, you know, we have a really good opportunity here to get what we need with a good chunk of, chunk of money from the state. So I think um, our planning is underway, and we'll use that to the best of our ability to make sure we're all set up for the fall. In one other little chiming of money I was on with the commissioner today, so this is information I didn't have last night. Um, the commissioner said the new federal um, package that's being kind of put through at the in, in DC could bring a lot more money to schools as well. And I don't know what the, you know, you can play the politics and what they're going to do, how they're going to tie strings to it and that kind of stuff. But they're talking about a lot more money coming again to schools. So again, these are things that we didn't have in June. So it's good news compared to what we were fearing in June is trying to do this without any support. At least we've gotten some so far. And um, so, so that was my, my, the one question. The other question I had is just, you know, and this is just knowledge that's coming from my own um, personal uh, uh, COVID-19 test that we got on Tuesday. And they tell, they, and the, they, they tell you that you get your results in 10 days, seven to 10 days now. And so if, if we live in a world that in the fall, test results are seven to 10 days still, and it's because all the local testing areas are overwhelmed with Florida and Texas tests that they have to do. Um, and if we still live in that kind of a world, how does that, does that impact the plan? I mean, I mean that, that seems to me a, a weakness under, underpinning everybody's plan. This, if, if test results come back in 10 days, that's, so I, I just give the brief overview of that. And I, Missy's got her hand up too. She might actually know more than I do. So I'll let you go first, Missy. <laughs> yeah, so I, um, I would be curious where you got your test done. You don't have to um, share that with me, but what I have seen clinically is that tests that are run by local labs, things that are run at Bay State or at Cooley, come back within a day or two. Tests that are run through larger facilities like CBS or Walmart that are going to get shipped to some central testing site several states away, those things take a long time to come back because they're getting shipped and then they're getting bulk run with a lot of other tests. Um, so what I had um, mentioned to Darius in an email is whether or not we could have any sort of conversation with Bay State or Cooley to maybe try to, or um, NEMA, the Mass Emergency uh, Management Association to to try to see if we could kind of set something up early so that we would have access to some quicker tests so that we don't have to run a week waiting for somebody to come back with results. So that's good. I, just just to let you know, I got my my test Tuesday morning at Community Health in uh, on Main Street in Greenfield, and uh, so they must send it out. And then they use Quest. They said they use Quest, which is right, what, what, a national and lab. They, and the, yeah, I guess, but it's, yeah. they got a local, they got a local facility. But it's, it's going to get local. shipped out. It's, it's going to get bulk and shipped out. So, I would follow up on a, a similar kind of topic. Uh, last week at work, I flew a passenger and I got home, and um, I was contacted by my company that I flew a passenger and had direct contact with someone who tested positive for COVID. So they took me off the schedule and quarantined me. 
Uh, and I went out and got a test and similar results, uh, NetJets uh, contracts with Quest Labs, that lab, that my test kit just showed up in the mail today. Um, Cooley Dickinson was a lot quicker. Um, but really where my question is with this, I was actually quite impressed with how my company, you know, traced a, uh, a positive test, contacted me, put me out off the schedule in, in the quarantine. And I guess is, is, is there going to be similar methods with students and or teachers where there's going to be some kind of tracing or if there's, um, you know, a, a case in the school or whatever, that child and or teacher is going to be, you know, rather than the whole school being shut down, just taking that one individual that had direct contact and quarantining them and waiting for a test to be able to come back or, or so forth. And that's a perfect introduction for Meg Birch, who had her hand up. <laughs> Meg, you there? Our nurse leader? I am sorry. I was madly typing a testing uh, comment about the testing. Um, and I apologize, um, Damien. I was listening, but I was also typing. And so um, I do not multitask well. Um, but in terms of the testing, um, Missy is absolutely right. It depends on where it goes. Um, there are a number of sites that are um, the, the samples go to a local lab for results. Um, Community Health Center is one that goes to Quest, which is national. So it does take seven to 10 days. Um, Phoebe Walker, uh, who is from the FERCOG, um, sent me an email earlier with a, 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 a tentative agenda for a meeting that she's working on setting up next. I don't think it's next week. I think it's the week after to talk with um, so far Bay State Franklin um, Community Health Center and um, Valley Medical about testing capacity um, in, and I asked her to include turnaround time um, as that is, is, as everybody has noted, really relevant for any kind of response to a concern about um, uh, community spread or spread within the school. Um, we do have something in our, um, in our plan about um, if, if the testing turnaround time um, locally is greater than 72 hours, that's going to be a flag um, that we bring to the local board of health to say, this isn't, this isn't workable. That's too long. Um, and I think one of the things that we can do, um, and it would be in partnership with Phoebe Walker and others, is just keep a bead on what is the testing return time. Um, she gets those updates regularly from um, the, the local providers. Um, I've asked her to add Cooley to the list for the meeting that's coming up. Um, but Damien, I don't think I'm really, I really got to your question because I didn't fully take it in and I apologize. I'll, so, okay, I'll ask you again. Um, and actually just to sum up, um, I, I'm now on the tail end of my quarantine and I tested negative. So I feel 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 okay here but um, my question is um, I, uh, I was impressed with the way my company reached out did the tracing you know took me off the schedule and and base, basically said you know you're, you're quarantined for 14 days is the is the school gonna do some kind of similar method where if there's a positive case a positive test anyone who's been in close proximity you know they will uh, be notified and quarantined as well, um, you know, some kind of uh, tracing, or is that really going to be left up, up to the uh, families and, and health officials? So um, that is something that we are looking at having that be a collaborative effort. So um, if, and, and there are draft protocols that I don't, I don't think have been put live in the, in the document um, quite yet um, for, uh, suspect or confirmed test result in a staff or a student. Um, and that notification is going to go to the local board of health. Often it's a public health nurse that works for the local board of health. Um, they in turn will notify the individual. That's their first call. 
And so we are asking individuals to notify the school. And then that allows us to start our process um, where um, we will be keeping, you know, at the elementary level, it's going to be fairly easy to keep accurate records like a log basically of, you know, the learning cohort and who was in and out of that classroom. And I was actually working on some um, protocols earlier about exactly what what documents we will maintain um, for contact tracing. We're going to have to ask parents if we can share their contact information with the local boards of health um, and staff to for us to share that information. But my intention would be to be able to provide the public health nurse or local board of health with a list of these are all the students that were in that learning cohort or in in those classes. These are all of the staff that were in those in those rooms looking at bus rosters as well. Um, and then honestly, it will depend on the local board of health, um, the degree to which the school nurses are able to assist in the contact tracing. And I am advocating hard for us to be able to assist in that process because it will expedite it. Um, when a test result comes into the board of health, that's protected confidential information. So we will be able to share that there is a positive test result or that somebody has, you know, is positive, but we won't be able to share who that person was. We will be asking anybody who we suspect that could have had close contact. Um, we are expecting to ask them to stay home. And, um, and part of the closure does include that if we know we have a positive test that we're going to do a short term closure to allow us um, and the local to work with the local board of health to get a, a handle on the situation um, and, and get all the communication in place without having it, um, you know, so if there were people exposed that were able to identify them and, and the contact tracing can happen. It's gonna be complicated. Yeah. Missy, uh, let me, Lynn has a question first, okay? Lynn? Um, I was just wondering how student, how teachers are going to maintain attendance in classes when you have a student who opts to say do remote learning and then they see that it's going okay, so now they want to come back in and then they, you know, their family is infected or um, in the presence of somebody who has this virus, so then they have to opt out again. How are teachers going to be able to maintain that? <laughs> Yeah, so I can speak to that a little bit, Darius, because we've had that conversation. Um, because the scheduling, as I said originally, the, the scheduling at the middle high school really runs the bus, um, we are putting a lot of time and energy into making those schedules. And so the fluidity of a student being able to opt into school once they have chosen the remote only is going to be pretty limited. So we're looking right now, we haven't finalize this, but we're looking really at the semester break as the period of time when they be able to come back in. Going out is a different story. So if a student is in the school and they need to opt out for health reasons or they need to opt out because it's just not working well for them, that's going to be an easier transition. Um, and I'm just um, speaking off the top of my head right now because I haven't confirmed with my colleagues, but the way that I would see that going is they would stay in their hybrid classes because they've already been a member of that school community and we wouldn't actively switch them over to the remote only teachers because it would involve some course changes. Um, and so it does get a little bit tricky. So hopefully the numbers of those students will be pretty low and we can keep track of them that way. Um, but the idea of attendance is that students are logging on at the beginning of each of their classes and that's when attendance is taken. That's when the assignments are getting. That's when a mini lecture might happen. Um, so it would be attendance in that that normal sort of way with uh, Michelle Russell, our attendance uh, person, making phone calls home in the normal way. If a student doesn't show up for class, uh, parents would be notified. Scott, do you want to add to that? No, I think you covered it exactly how I would have. Thanks. Uh, Missy, you had a question again? Sorry. Yeah, um, sorry. I, that's I, all right. No, I, I, I should have said was, it differently. That's, that's all right. I was curious whether or not there are state funds um, because the state is developing a, a and has a group of contact tra tracers 
to have somebody within the school uh, and also get some state funds to have somebody in the school as a contact tracer. Meg, I don't, or, I don't know the answer to if the state's doing that. I mean, Meg is a contact tracer, but yeah. <laughs> I don't think she's not on our payroll to do it. Yeah, I'm, I'm a contact tracer for the FERCOG Cooperative Public Health District. So it does include two of our towns, but not all of our towns. I think it's an excellent question. Um, and I have a meeting next week with uh, the public health nurses and, um, from the FERCOG, as well as others in Franklin County, because one of the things that we're all talking about is how are we going to do this effectively and efficiently because we're not just looking at our four towns, right? Um, we have we have students from other towns, we have staff that live in other other towns and who live outside of the county. And so that all of that coordinated response is going to be critical. Um, I like the idea. I think um, maybe, maybe that's a question for the county and, um, to see if we can, and it would, I will be talking to the, what is it, Darius Mapco, the Mohawk Area Public Health Coalition, which is all of the boards of public health for Franklin County next Tuesday. Um, I think sort of proposing, you know, can we have a school person that is the school contact tracer or a discrete team of school contact tracers um, for Franklin County? Um, that that could be really efficient and helpful for all of the districts. I mean, in, in addition to that, because Meg brings up a point, we, we met this morning, Meg and I met with the local uh, Board of Health, um, kind of they do a biweekly meeting and we talked a little bit about schools and we also brought up our concerns about, you know, you know, keeping an eye on the, what are we gonna use for indicators in our community that will affect the school changing, you know, um, from one phase to another um, or having to close um, or to assess, you know, that kind of thing. And so they also are going to bring that to the MACO because whatever we do, you know, it, we're just four towns, but I mean, a lot of our neighboring towns really should have the same metrics. And I know last night, so this is all kind of, it's all live information. Last night I said I would try to have those metrics for the next school committee meeting for, you know, for, for 38, which is Tuesday. And now you just heard that that meeting is Tuesday morning. So I'm not sure I'm going to have those things. There's going to kind of be a blank in that part of our protocols. I'm um, saying we're going to insert the, the, the you know the, the statistics there, but I want to just kind of put that out there too because we're looking at that, and that's not just our small towns. I was talking with Provost from um, John Provost, who's the superintendent of Northampton. He's looking at the same thing, wanting to get some kind of regional. What are we going to use for regional data? Is the state going to provide us data as well? And then also taking consideration that our region is different. You know, you know, and we have smaller populations. It looks, you know, we want percentages that make sense for our population as well. So um, we're working on that as well. <clears throat> uh, Judy, did I see you have a question, Judy? I just I just typed um, whether or not there were any updates on transportation to share, or if that's just sort of in a holding pattern until we make a determination on the final model. So uh, Shelly and I sat down with the Gripco um, bus company, just kind of giving them an update about where things were because, you know, being an independent vendor, they don't get the state, they don't get the state, you know, emails I get, I gave, and I've also passed on all the new regulations from um, the state. I, you know, we, we had an initial, initial conversation about if we have to adjust runs due to population because we, you know, we put out that survey to parents about how many would be willing to, um, willing or able to drive their your students to school to reduce the pop, you know, numbers on the buses and you know in our particular population we were very fortunate that um, the initial feedback we got was was quite a few I mean it was like 85 percent um, let me make sure I'm right on the number but close you know it was, it was a high number like that that we really could reduce the number of drivers and especially at the you know at the high school um, so I was asking if we could change routes around because if you have one town that can't do that can I give them you know four or five buses rather than you know, two or three buses and talked about a little bit about money and that kind of thing. Um, we also talked about, you know, if we have less buses and we remove, we remove runs. And so we're just having conversations about that. Um, you know, it's going to turn into, you know, contractual talks if, you know, we get up going a remote way about, you know, how, what are we going to be, have to owe on that contract um, and that kind of thing. And that's a more dicey thing, which we would have to go to an executive session because that'd be contracting talking about contracts, but, you know, so there is, so we just had an initial thing. It was a friendly conversation, exchange of information, and I've been forwarding them information as I get it. And I said, I'll be back in touch when I have an idea of what we're doing in the fall, so. 
to double up on what you just said, Darius. I saw Steven today and had a little chit chat, and he he appreciates the updates that you guys um, are giving him and stuff. So I he was happy while he was working on one of his buses. So um, is there any other school committee members that have questions? Scott, did anybody else there that I missed? And if no, if no one else, if no one no. else does, then if there's any public out there, parents, um, town right. people. Um, I think it'd probably be a good idea to have Allison Walker, uh, Walter speak on behalf of the FRTA for public comment, and then I'll go to some uh, other uh, folks who has some um, questions here. Go ahead, Allison. Thanks, Thank you. Hi, everybody. Um, just for people who don't know me, um, I am Allison Walters. I'm the president of the Frontier um, Regional Teachers Association, and I represent both Unit A and Unit C, our instructional assistants and LPNs, um, as well as all of the licensed educators. And I'm just here today to speak to some of the concerns that teachers have been discussing and raising and thank you for the people who were asking questions about how people, how the teachers were feeling, how staff were feeling. I might be able to provide you with some information. I'm hoping I don't take too long, but I think I can do this in about five minutes if you can bear with me. Um, we've done some surveys that really have been looking at people's major concerns and the needs looking at both um, the hybrid and the remote models. So what I thought I would do is just, just go through a couple of the findings with some of the top rated concerns. Um, I'm more than happy to talk to people to tell you further um, details. And then I wanted to sort of share some quotes in some conversations that have been going on of just some of the things that people are thinking about right now. Um, the first thing that, that I think people do need to know is I did do, um, a question that asked people uh, who are members of the asso association what their age brackets were. Just because I think that that's a really important piece of information for people to have because age does play a factor in whether or not we're in a higher risk category or not. And from the, the survey that was done on Monday, um, we had close to 50 responses. Um, 43%, almost 44% were 51 or over. And this doesn't even go into looking at administrative staff, custodial staff, cafeteria staff. I mean, this is only of the 48 people who responded and the majority of them were teachers um, with a smaller number of unit C members. Um, so it was um, like 30, about, about 38% were 51 to 60. And then um, over 6% were over 61 years old. So that was the first one. Um, the second thing was um, we asked for some concerns that people might have with the hybrid model. Um, and we had taken the top five from a previous survey. And all I'm what I'm going to do is I'm going to go through like the top two concerns in each of the categories that we asked. The number one concern was transmission of COVID the feasibility and the protocols and how to prevent the transmission of this disease if we're in the hybrid model. Um, the second was daycare for teachers, children, families, um, especially if there were parents in the district or out of district, but that was, that was number two. Um, the next was looking at concerns for the remote model. And this was open so people could, could at first provide feedback and then what we did is we took the feedback and we took the top five and they ranked them so i have the listings of the top five um, when we looked at concerns for the remote model the number one concern was equity and access for students um, that was the number one concern the second was student engagement attendance and then the quality of instruction and that was the number two priority in the concerns with the remote model the next question was, if we were to return to a hybrid model of instruction, um, please rank the most identified needs that you have that you would need the administration to address. Number one was enforcement of safety protocols and procedures, masks, social distancing, 
bathroom policies, traffic patterns, how would people move around the building um, and how, you know, would everything be um, uh, monitored? The second was um, safety procedures and protocols, clarity for the staff and students in getting training and the need for um, everybody to be trained in those areas. If we were to return the remote model, the number, um, the, the top two identified needs that we would like the administration to know about were student expectations, including grading, consequences, um, schedules. And then the second was teacher and um, staff expectations, that they be clear and everybody is on the same page. Um, if we were to return with the hybrid model in the fall, we also asked about professional development and technology needs that people had. The top um, professional development need was safety, PPE and procedures training for the staff. Um, and then number two was um, tied for professional time to plan and meet with colleagues to um, get ourselves up to speed and, and do what we need to do in the hybrid model because it is, it's different. It's not the same as in-class day-to-day -day teaching. And then also the issue of hardware, making sure we've got access to the hardware and software that we need to ensure that we could um, do um, the teaching we needed to do with both the students in the school and students outside of the school. The next question was about if we were to return to a remote model um, what were the professional development and technology needs? Uh, number one was time to plan how to do this. Um, and number two was tied between the hardware and then getting um, up to speed and using Schoology and figuring out, you know, how we're best going to be doing that. With the state giving us 10 days, that um, would probably be something that a lot of the teachers would hope they had time to be to be using that time to to work on um, planning and using Schoology. Um, another question that we asked is if we were fully remote would people be comfortable teaching um, in their classroom and working in the building teaching remotely from their classroom? Um, almost half said yes. Um, about 40 percent aren't sure because they they just don't know because we know there's so much that is changing every single day um and and so many people have have you know concerns and and are paying attention to everything that's going on um and before i get to some quotes there were the, the last question was please rank the importance of these most identified health and safety concerns from our previous surveys the number one concern was clear and enforced enforced procedures for social distancing, masks, and other safety measures across the board. Number two was tied to um, what are the procedures if there's a positive COVID case in the community, in the school, who gets quarantined? Does this require using sick time? Um, what are school procedures for people to come back? I mean, that's a big category. Um, and the other one was um, how are the faculty and staff in high risk categories? going to be taken care of, um, who it's not really safe for them to be in the building. Um, the other thing that is interesting is what's just come out from the state is that the governor has now issued quarantine, you know, stay at home quarantine um, orders for people coming from states other than the few that are designated as not being hotspots. Um, I know that there's a concern that teachers have in one of the quotes. It's like there are so many people who are going to be going on vacation and coming back into the district that may be in areas that are hot spots. And are these families and are these people going to be quarantined? Are they going to self-quarantine? Um, and that that is a concern that people have. Um, and, uh, you, know, the, you know, how do the governor's orders uh, match up with that? Um, so so a couple of of quotes and I had asked permission. Um, I'm not going to use names, but there was like an email chain that was going on yesterday that had, you know, really good um, conversations going on about what some pe people were thinking after doing the survey. Um, one of them, one of the concerns um, raised was that the number of positive cases listed is actually not the number of 
positive cases that are in the area. Um, and it's uh, the number of people who were tested and got a positive result. Many people may have been sick and not having had tests. Um, another big concern is the biggest concern is that children are usually asymptomatic. How would we know if students are carrying something coming into the building. And I know that that's producing a lot of anxiety um, with people in um, the FRTA. Um, there's the worry um, that if we didn't begin the school year remotely, would the, would the community quarantine if there were people coming from different areas and, and bringing all these people together that might be coming from areas that maybe should, should be quarantined? Um, that was just an issue brought up. Um, I know people are looking at what are, you know, the, the unknowns, like the long-term impacts of the virus. Um, if somebody did get sick, um, there are people that are concerned, um, about a rush to implement a hybrid plan, um, and wanting to do it well and possibly starting remote, um, which allows all people in the district, to, all the students and families to be able to sort of quarantine the kids before they came back in the building for a certain period of time. Um, another one is um, there's so much we still don't know about the virus. And the one thing um, we do not know is how to keep people safe indoors when it comes to needing to have people inside because of either inclement weather or, you know, it's New England and fall comes, whatever, whatever the weather may bring. Um, and again, another concern about people returning to the community from being away on vacation. If people go to places like Florida or, or California, um, I think people are really worried about what um, they may be bringing back. Um, there is a real concern, this comes up over and over again, about the health and safety protocols and enforcement. Like, what do we do if a student is yanking their mask off um, in a classroom? and possibly exposing people. And, and people are concerned about that. Um, the other, another thing is people are, are really concerned about having clear guidance that if anybody, whether it's a student or whether it's a staff member, that if they feel sick, they need to stay home. If they feel sick, if they have, especially if they have any of the symptoms that are that are um, symptoms that could be possibly COVID, that the that the requirement is that people are staying home. Um, of course, teachers and and staff members will wonder about sick time, but it's it's the people need to feel that their that their jobs aren't at stake, or that they're going to lose pay, or you know that parents are going to keep home students um, if they've got a cough or, or you know, a, a runny nose and, and they're running a bit of a fever. Um, I know that, that people do worry because um, all teachers know that, that children come to school sick. Um, teachers come to school sick. Other staff come to school sick. And, and that needs to be uh, an important uh, piece of the culture of the building that would need to be um, clearly addressed. Um, and then there were like just some logistical questions, not asking for answers, but just bringing them up with arrivals and, and dismissals. Um, who greets the students in the morning? How are they dismissed going out of the building? How do we transition within the building around classes um, in and out? Who gets to go outside? Who gets to be inside if we can if we can do both? Um, will students bring hand sanitizer or will they be given hand sanitizer? Will it be in all the rooms? What about students leaving and going to the bathroom? You know, these are all the things that people are thinking about. Um, what happens if students do things like forget Chromebooks that, that they, um, you know, need to have in class? Uh, what about books? That's, that's a big thing. Um, the rules for masks, it's just having them being clear, the social distancing. Um, will students be carrying around like a bag or a box with their supplies? Um, where do they store it? Uh, what do they do with their materials day to day? Um, are there places in classrooms where this would go? Um, what about temperatures in classrooms? What if it gets too hot? Um, what about windows being open? What if it's 
you know, getting too cool. What about fan use? These are all things that people are thinking about. Um, what if a student is saying things like, oh, I can't wear a mask, it's too hard. What are the protocols for mask breaks? I know that that's something that, that has been talked about and, and mentioned. And I think people are, are looking to, to hear a little bit more and understand a little bit more. Um, who's going to be um, cleaning and disinfecting classrooms? How's, how's the cleaning process going to take place? Um, and then let's see. The last last thing I wanted to say was in the in our first sur that survey that we sent out, we did ask a couple of questions that just asked people to sort of give their opinion of, of their comfort levels. Um, the first question was, um, given the current draft proposals, and and mind you, this was when there was sort of like the all in person model as well, and not just really looking at a hybrid or a remote. Um, 57.5% were either somewhat uncomfortable or very uncomfortable coming back in person. Um, and then when asked if there was a preferred model moving forward to start the fall, 60% um, preferred remote. And, um, and that's before this new updated one for people to take a look at, but um, I hope that can give people a little snapshot of how the teachers have been feeling, how the instructional assistants and, and the LPNs, um, the nurses, the um, guidance counselors, the adjustment counselors, I mean, all of the people who are the, the licensed professionals in Unit A and Unit C. So, um, thanks. Thanks, Allison. And I'm happy to answer any questions if any of the school committee has any questions as well. Judy, you're unmuted. You want to say something? I just want to ask what the total number of people that the FRTA, um, like what's what's the number of people that are in that group, Allison? Right, right now, together, both unit A and unit C, and this doesn't include new staff because we don't know who the new staff are, um, are 82 members. Thank you. Okay, um, if there's no other committee people want to say something, Scott, do we have people that want to say something public? Uh, yes, uh, the first uh, person from the public uh, was uh, Carrie Thurlow, if you'd like to ask a question. Carrie, are you still with us? Yes, I am. I just had to turn everything back on. Sorry about that. And actually, okay. I'm not so much asking a question. I'm, I'm the grandparent and legal guardian of two high needs boys with autism. So my, my concern is specifically related to special education and our experiences from the springtime right up until now and how profoundly affected my students and other students have been because of the closures. And I'm not really sure that unless you have a special ed student or you're a special ed teacher, that m many people understand what it is to have to live this. So, um, you know, first off, in the springtime, as you guys were rolling out over a weekend, my husband and I, we saw this coming. And we invested literally thousands of dollars to be able to educate our children during the school closure. Because we knew that based on autism, based on their need for sameness and consistency and structure and routine, a remote learning setting is not geared, geared to students like that. Even four days in school isn't necessarily optimal for a student who is completely routine dependent. Um, things that we noticed almost straight away, in addition to having to buy textbooks and develop quickly some lesson plans and figure out from report cards where kids were and using their progress reports to try to keep them on track 
because, you know, going from two and a half, two hours a day of one-on-one, -on -one, highly structured, small group and one-on-one -on -one to 30 minutes a day. That's what my kids got, 30 minutes a day. My kids have successfully lost sixth grade. That puts one of my boys' functional education level back down to second grade. That puts the other boys' functional education level back down to fourth grade. Keeping, keeping our kids, the special needs kids, out of school, even in a hybrid environment, is going to affect our communities astronomically. Because these children are six, seven years away from becoming citizens, independent members of our committee, of our communities, and they're not going to have the skills that they need in order to be able to participate because we had a lockdown for a year and a half of their education. My boys, you know, they dealt with self-destructive behaviors they dealt with self-injury they dealt with i mean the meltdowns i had meltdowns in my house with children on opposite ends and trying to protect each one from harming themselves just because they couldn't talk to their teacher because they couldn't see their, their counselor because they had to try to do OT remotely. The services our kids get do not lend themselves well or easily to a remote or a hybrid setting. Plain and simple. You are asking, you're asking a child who has very small short attention spans, learning windows of 20 minutes to be able to sit still and participate meaningfully in online education starting from 7.45 in the morning until three in the afternoon. And then for many of us, our children go to community-based services or in-home services for up to four more hours after their school day. So I've had to, you know, first time in years, we had to restrain physically restrain one of our children from putting his head through a window because school was canceled. And that's, that's not, it's not a realistic standard to keep our families living at. And even in some of the targeted meetings, I need, we need people to hear us say that high need students, it's not going to work unless they're in the building, unless they have direct contact with their teachers, with their providers, with their pullout services, with their peers. Because, you know, sub-separate, you know, that's great. My boys aren't sub-separate. They spend 60% of their day in mainstream education. But that's not a real reflection of their need level. Their need level is, you know, Mr. Delaney's seventh grade FTEP class, which on paper isn't sub-separate, but in reality it is. So it's, it's challenging, you know, and how do we balance, what are the guidelines that are gonna be used for determining high needs IEPs versus general IEPs. No, no IEP is general. By the time that you people get to see an IEP, we people have been through literally years of diagnosis with our kids and services and testing and assessments. And they have to fall into a category, a highly targeted one. So none of them are just general IEPs. They're for valid reasons. Diagnosed psychological medical reasons. And, you know, unless we act to keep our kids in school as long as possible, individuals who are business owners 
their job, their, their hiring candidate pool is going to reduce. Keeping these kids out of school means that it might delay their entry into college or into a trade program or into some other post-secondary opportunity because, again, learning windows only stay open for a certain amount of time. And in doing so, by not allowing them to come back, that window shuts and we don't get a chance to have our children educated to the standard that they need to be. Thank you. Thanks, Carrie. Karen, do you want to chime in a little bit at all? Absolutely. Hi, Carrie. Thank you, Carrie. Um, a lot was said there, um, and you know, I am I am familiar with Carrie, and I know that um, you know it's a lot to share, and that it's very difficult. Um, I, I think the thing I want to talk about, um, and Carrie, we can talk m more um, off offline because I know there's a lot to be discussed today. So I think the thing I've really pulled out of this is how are we going to make those decisions regarding who our high priority students are. And a frustration that I hear is actually coming out of a strength of our district is our high need students are included. So the way the guidance is written is students that are in substantially separate programs and not to go too much detail for the public, that's called a placement. And we don't have many students that actually have a placement page that they're actually out of the general ed environment for over 60% of the time. So when you think of our FTAP program, or if you think of our life skills program, or if you think of our autism program, we actually have those students going into the general ed environment and they're not actually pulled out of the general ed environment. So Carrie's concern and many concerns of parents as well then, and so the language I think that came out in the original document must just have said substantially separate programs. But Carrie, please know that we are behind the scenes and I will correct that language actually realizing that our students that are in that high level of need when we come to the table and say, hey, we got this FTEP program, but then your placement cage comes out because you're actually pushing in. If we have identified that your level of need needs to be with one of our intensive teachers in those programs, even if your IEP is substantially separate, you're being recognized as a high need student. We are having those conversations. I haven't caught up with the document yet. I'm sure those who have written it are going, oh my gosh, we can't have the word general IEP in there anymore. We'll fix that, okay? We understand that all individualized education plans are individual education plans. Communication, uh, when you're working with a lot of people that really is identifying and um, structures within the school that are saying, hey, we have some kids that we, we know in our structures are pulled out for English or, or receive supplemental service during, uh, I'm not doing, uh, what's the, advisory time. Um, and it's a model and a structure that we use at Frontier all the time. So in those minds, those are our general, if you will, we'll fix that language. Um, if there's a supplemental service where you have maybe 30 minutes a day or 45 minutes a day in that structure, those will be the students who have the additional day. For those students that are combined with both pull out um, and push in for general education classes, we are identifying those as high need students. I know that's a lot of detail for those of you who don't have students in special needs, but as you can tell, there's a language that we're accustomed to. And, and I'll ensure that because we're so strong in our inclusive practices, we know who those high needs kids are even if their IEPs say partial inclusion, and, and, and we'll make sure that we're focusing on that, okay? Uh, but thank you for bringing that up. Okay. Thanks, Karen. Yep. Heather Mominy, you're up next. Heather, Heather Mominy. Hello. <laughs> I just had a quick question. Um, I work for DCF, and I know that a lot of my families relied on the free lunches. And I was just wondering in the hybrid uh, program, if that would still be offered to um, the families that qualified. Scott, do you want me to, do you want to address that? Uh, I think Darius was shaking his head. So let's, let's let him. <laughs> okay, yes. in, a simple, in a simple answer, yes. We will continue to provide um, 
in the hybrid model, we're providing um, lunches for both the families that are in the school, our regular lunch program. So you can have the option to purchase lunch, also providing um, lunch service for those students on free and reduced lunch um, and um, doing um, uh, either pick up, we have to figure out how we're gonna exactly do that depending on the numbers, but pick up and delivery of, of uh, uh, the lunches like we did over the summer. So, um, and if we were going to remote model, um, there's actually still some discussion about that at the state level if you're a full remote model, whether or not they're going to qualify that. But, you know, we're going to find a way because I think it's an important, important service that we continue. And Darius, can I just add, can I just add something to that? So we did have a meeting with Mary DeLusa today, um, who's our, the head of our, our food services. And just one of the things just to keep in mind is that um, the, the majority of the delivery drivers currently are teachers. So uh, they, if we go back, if we go into a hybrid model, there they may be unavailable to do certain deliveries. So, so if anybody out there is, in, if we go to a hybrid model, if anybody out there is interested in helping us out with deliveries, please reach out to Mary Delusa, or you can reach out to myself, or you can reach out to Scott. Thanks. Thanks, George. Uh, Holly, John, Holly, Holly Johnson, you're up next. Hello. I have a daughter at Frontier. Um, I have, I'd like to make a statement on behalf of the CPAC. I'm co-chair of the district CPAC. Um, and then I'd like to make a, just a personal parent comment, but I wanna thank Carrie um, for all she said. I feel like that covered any comment that I could possibly read off a piece of paper. Um, she's not the only one dealing with that. Um, my child on an IEP is not in high school. She's still in elementary school, but her services went from 16 a week to two or three. And it's awful and it's, and it really needs to be the priority. And it is spelled out in DESE that they are for prioritized for full in-person, full-time in-person learning. It has to be tried, attempted, all methods possible to make the in-person happen and this is going to be the top of our discussion when as as cpac when we meet with the strategic planning committee the end of this week um not only that but the acknowledgement that all these services and time lost will have to be made up the time will have to be taken with these with our children to make those services available to make up for this time as much as we possibly can because you truly can't make it all up but to to the best of the district's effort to make that up without fighting without trouble it's very it's really important it, you can't under like Carrie said if, unless you have a child at home it's really difficult to understand the impact of the miss, there was no remote learning. For, I mean, so many, they can't, they can't sit in front of a computer. They can't participate in OT and PT remotely. It doesn't happen, speech. Um, so I wanna thank you very much for Car Carrie for speaking. I had a little piece of paper. I was a statement that we wrote and I was gonna read it, but you um, covered more than, than I possibly could in that statement. And I do wanna say, if you read through the DESE guidelines, it has clear um, what can, what students are going to um, qualify for these services. It's not just high needs. It's it's it says if students who cannot engage in remote learning due to their disability related day their disability related needs. So there's a whole lot of guidelines beyond just high needs. Um, and thank you on behalf of the CPAC, Carrie. Thank you for speaking and thank you everyone for listening. And now if I could just speak for a moment as a parent of a high schooler. Um, so I'm still deciding whether or not to send my daughter to the hybrid model or, or keep her home. Um, my big issue with the hybrid model, and I think um, Allison, the, the teacher rep who said um, a lot of what I'm thinking, the um, the, how long are these mass breaks? I, you know, they're called breaks and then they're saying when they're seated six feet apart and I, that makes me uncomfortable and it doesn't feel clear. My concern with remote, whether it's partial remote or full remote, is that 
it really did not work for my daughter. Um, she struggled with motivation and depression in the spring. My, she was a straight A student um, and she went weeks without handing in assignments or attending classes and not one teacher emailed me or called me or checked in to see if she was okay. And I emailed and I called, but in the end, she ended up with no credit in those two classes, no credit, credit for the fourth quarter. And I wanna know what's gonna be different in the fall because she's gonna be at least partially remote. Um, I read the social, emotional health and wellness part of the plan. And I would hope that is fully intended to be implemented all the way through high school level. I saw that there's emotional check-ins and I would hope that that would work both ways. That person wouldn't just be that contact person, wouldn't just be there for the students and the families to reach out to, but they would be reaching out because my child was, she engaged in sports, in the play, straight A since first grade. And to have no teacher reach out when she's not completing assignments, which is so not like her, um, was really disheartening and um, not at all my experience with my children at the elementary level. So I think that um, regardless of what model we you wrote on, um, I really think the outreach needs to be improved. Um, and again, I know this, I spoke at so many meetings, but I know that um, this is incredibly difficult for all of you. And I really do appreciate all the work you're putting in and really the number of meetings that you were having and staying late and answering all our questions that you can. I really do appreciate that. So thank you. Thanks, Holly. All right, uh, next question is from Janet Pompelli um, regarding Chromebooks. And just for everyone's knowledge, uh, we have a regular rotation from the ID, IT department. They're all over that, um, cycling through new ones and transitioning the ones from the graduating seniors uh, back in the rotation and buying new ones for the ones that age out. So that answers that question. I think that's it for questions. Jerry has a question. You see the new one? Hi, sorry. Um, yeah, I was just wondering what lockdowns would look like. Um, given that usually the kids are kind of close together during even a lockdown drill. Um, so what, what, what are the protocols for that? Want me to try, Scott? You want to try? <laughs> I, I mean, basically, I think both lockdowns and fire drills, you know, we're gonna have to modify them so that we're learning the procedures, but we're not putting additional risk of health risks during them. So lockdown procedures, you know, we'll lock the doors, students are still six feet apart, they're keeping their masks on. You know, we're just going through the, the process of, you know, how do we find safe spaces in the building and locking it down um, and, and all the things we do during a lockdown drill. Same thing with a fire drill, you know, um, we'd probably just have to run it a little differently. It wouldn't just be, you know, we did in the past. Scott, I mean, Scott, you lead that in the building. You have thoughts on, have thoughts on that? Yeah, right. Um, honestly, we've, we've kind of put a pause button on scheduling certain things right now until we figure out what we're doing. Um, uh, and, and typically, by this time of the year, I have all of the fire drills scheduled with the fire department, and, and we've discussed at different times of the day when they're going to happen. We haven't done that yet because I want to I, I want to make sure we know what we're looking at first. Um, same with the lockdown drills. Uh, Trooper Carmichael, who runs the Western Mass, uh, he's the liaison from the state police um, for the school safety plans. Um, we have not met yet to schedule anything and to, to really talk about what that would look like if we have some classes outside and, and you know, um, where we are in the building. Um, so those are details we still need to work out. Thank you. Does anybody else have any questions? Uh, Carrie has another question. Just the comment, you know, modifying it and just teach it. How do you teach that to a nonverbal mobility limited person who's seven years old, eight years old, 13 years old? That's not something that you can just teach and hope that, oh yeah, when this happens, they're gonna remember. No, it doesn't work that way. Our kids learn by doing. And it's, so it's not just a matter of, yeah, we can just do dry rot. No, that doesn't work. 
that that doesn't work. It's like it's like remote education for special needs. It doesn't work. Well, Carrie, uh, what I would say to that is that um, what we do regularly with our teachers and of of our our, our special ed teachers is I typically give the schedule to them and they can do a lot of pre-teaching and, and specifically with our nonverbal uh, students, there's a lot of uh, storyboarding that's going on and, and pre-teaching to that. And um, when that event comes, the teachers, for example, you know, we have um, our ALPS program, they have, they have rehearsed and practiced before that. And they know, um, you know when the fire drill goes off, the sounds of the fire alarms can be triggering and very uh, difficult. So they've prepped our kids for that. Does anybody else have any any comments? Darius or Sarah, do you have anything else for us tonight? No, I mean, I, so that being just for the public listening, the, the timeline is that we're going to be meeting next week. We do need to talk about the, the next week's timeline because I did realize that our next meeting is in the same evening as um, last night. And so while our meeting's at five, if it goes late, um, you know, my administrators need to get off. And I, at the same time, I'm, I also know that there's, you know, we have a member of our committee who's got a graduate, um, a graduating senior here. Um, and so I'm wondering if we would move it, if you, do we want to try to, still do it at five? Do we want to move it to Thursday? Um, just kind of getting people's thoughts on that. I don't know the length of the meeting, but at the same time, um, it's gonna be a busy night for um, the frontier administrators. Well, with what's going on and stuff, I think we should, I personally think we should move it to Thursday night, but I'm open to any other suggestions from, from the committee members. Would that be better for you, Lynn? Doesn't matter to me. <laughs> well, you have a graduating senior, so. I don't, I have an incoming senior, but she's going to be a graduation practice. She's okay. gonna be helping out with graduation, but she drives. Okay, okay. So you guys wanna keep it for Wednesday night or you wanna do it for Thursday night, committee members? Well, you know, what we could do is if we want to keep, you know, my only problem is I put it out there to everybody publicly, what we, what the, the plan was, that's my only concern there is we're okay. moving things around. Um, you know, I, if we go at five, we just know, you know, let, you know, Scott and George go and Sarah go at six and we'll just have to bend without them. Okay. Darius, Scott and I have to be, in, we have to be in makeup, I think by six. <laughs> <laughs> If, if you guys are fine with that, then I think we could probably pull it off. You guys are fine with that, Scott, Scott and George. You guys are fine with that. I don't know what your, your pre. I don't know what your makeup schedule is. So as long as as long as we can as long as we can um, as long as we can uh, step out from the meeting a little bit early, I think I think we'll I think we'll be okay. Mary, did you have? Do you, have, do you, do you guys have Sarah as part of your your last night operation? No, we don't need her. Right, well, if, I, I see what I, you know, I saw Mary saying that they can't be rushed, but if I have Sarah, she's got the knowledge of what Scott and George have as well as their, as their team down there. So, you know, I think we can probably, we'll have all the information needed. And you guys are in the building. I'll come get you if I really need you. <laughs> okay. Can I, I just want to say just a couple little things. Um, and I think this question has been answered before. And if we do remote learning, does all our kids even uh, school choice kids, does everybody have Wi-Fi access? Did we have a problem at all? Scott, I see you yeah. shaking your head. So, yeah, there, there, is, there are some students, whether they're, you know, in certain Hilltown locations or for various other reasons, um, did not have uh, access to Wi-Fi. One of the things that we would like to be able to provide during the, the school day with the hybrid model is, is uh, sort of like an internet internet cafe kind of thing where we have a, a monitored place and we were thinking of commandeering the gym and set up tables and, and there's a strong Wi-Fi presence there um, and, and, and locating and, and purchasing additional hives to put in there to handle the, the Wi-Fi model. And they can use that space 
to complete some of their work um, because of any access issues they have at home. How many, how many do you think we have problems with, you know, off the top of your head? It's, it's not many, and I don't have a concrete number for you. Um, so it's just anecdotal, but it was, um, it was, it was a little over a handful. Okay. The other question I had was, you know, with families taking vacations, are we going to do some type of survey or send something out? If you go on vacation in a non, one of these non states, are we, are we going to, you know, hold them liable? You know, if, if they go out and, you know, they're coming back the day before school starts, uh, what on roughly the fourteenth of September, are we going to try to hold them liable at all? Or they they are going to? I hope it's a good question. I'm asking. So yeah, no. I mean, families are going to be expected to follow the, uh, the 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 new governor's orders. And so, if they did leave the state and go to a hot spot, they're going to have to have tested before they can return, or they're going to have to quarantine. And so, right now, with the ten days, you know, we 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 preset that calendar to August twenty sixth. Um, so we kind of told families that. So if families are now doing extended vacation after the date we already set, um, you know, we should the actually those ten days should actually help us because every you know you know everybody should be back. But if they decide to go out, then they, the rules are out there set by the governor, and we'll be enforcing on our end to where we can. We can go so far, but we'll be saying you know you're out of the state, you need to be you know we'll report you to the board of health, and you'll be fined mm -hmm. for whatever the the story is there. You know people have to. We have to have our community be part. We all have a responsibility in this, and it's also what we're going to, have to explain to our community because we all have a, a responsibility to each other. And if people are going to go to Florida on September first, because all of a sudden we gave them a couple more days, um, then you know they're going to have to have, you know use do what that we've said as a community is what we're going to do to be safe. Okay. Thank you. Does anybody else have anything they want to share? If not, I need a motion to adjourn, and we'll roll call. So I got one quick question. Okay, Phil. So uh, just just the more I'm thinking about just the the plans for next week's meeting, I, I'm this is just such a momentous topic. Yesterday we had 100 and what 20 on the 40, so 41 today. And I I mean I, I don't know. I would personally feel com more comfortable, a lot more comfortable if um, if at least you know as these votes are taken next week. Um, and up to that point that the entire administration staff is available and on the call. I mean, I, so, so if that means moving it to Thursday, then that's what would be my preference. Just because the questions, the heartfelt questions that are, that are being asked of us are so granular in nature. And, um, and, and I think we're all, we're better served if, if the, the people with the most granular knowledge of, of the answers is, are available. So that's just my thought on that. And if that messes everything up, I apologize. So. Darius, you want to? It's your meeting, folks. You know, you're, you quite, you frankly can, you can have as many meetings as you want and whenever you want. You know, um, so you can move into Thursday. I don't think it's the end of the world. You know, it's the school committee's decision to do that. We'll post it, um, you know, because when we post the link anyways, that's for how people get on to this meeting. So I think it's, it's an understandable reason class night and graduation are two big important dates in our calendar. And I screwed up by putting that date on the calendar and not thinking about, you know, not thinking about that, um, that, that event. So how about if I just... How about if I just ask everybody um, whether they we should change it from Wednesday? I, I see you popping in, Keith, from Wednesday to Thursday. If I just ask them, should we change it, yes or no? And that way we'll we'll know. Is that okay? Just, yeah, just have them raise their hand. If they yes or no, you can pick it even quicker. Judy, you want to switch it? Yes. Phil, you want to switch it? Yes. Damien? Uh, it doesn't matter to me, and if that helps, uh, if that helps people, I'm fine with Thursday. Keith, I got the thumbs up for changing. Bill, no, don't change it. Don't change it. Mary, yes, change it. Olivia, uh, whatever works. It's fine. Missy, I'm in the same boat. Whatever works. And Lynn, yeah, we'll whatever change. works. Well. I think the overall was to change it. So we'll, we'll change it to Thursday night, Darius. 
Will do. I know that's more work for Donna. Sorry, Donna. Donna. Donna can handle it. I know. I'll, so hear, we'll change, I'll hear about it later. <laughs> Thanks, Donna. So we'll change it to Thursday night. Um, if nothing else, uh, I need a motion to adjourn. Move to Mr. Jaron. Second. Okay. Uh, roll call. Judy. Yep. Phil. Yes. Damien. Yes. Keith. Yes. Bill. Yeah. Mary. Yes. Olivia. Yes. Missy. Yes. And Lynn. Yes. We'll see you guys uh, next Thursday night. Do we have an executive session tonight, Bob? I don't. No, I, I I put that on putting on all of them because if we were going to talk about um, the the teacher's contract as a revolt to one of these plans, you should have the ability to go to an executive session, but it didn't come up, so we don't need to. Okay, thank you. Good night, everybody.